Hi, this is Pat Moorhead with More Insights and Strategy, and we are here with a More Insights and Strategy Insider Podcast. I'm so pleased to introduce, and I want to make sure that I get this right, uh, Ross Jatou from On Semiconductor. Ross, how are you today? Good. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, maybe a good place to start is uh, talk a little bit about uh, what you do for On Semi and maybe a little bit about your background, uh, because I know it's very uh, linked to what you do today. Great, yeah. Uh, Patrick, I'm uh, uh, responsible for uh, the intelligence sensing group at On Semiconductor, uh, reporting to our CEO. Um, previously, uh, I was uh, in charge of the automotive um, business, uh, and more recently expanded my responsibilities and opportunities into other segments of sensing, uh, whether it's machine vision, um, robotics, uh, traditional 2D imaging, uh, all the sensing and aspects that on semiconductor. It's quite exciting. Oh my gosh, I know. And if I think of uh, the different roles, if I ever uh, wanted to go back and have a real job, uh, I think uh, I would pick that exact area because uh, not only are uh, is the amount of electrification increasing in autumn in cars, but also the intelligence and sensing where it has more cameras and more sensors and more machine learning uh, than most devices on on the planet. So super, super exciting. Uh, why don't we start by talking uh, about uh, ADAS? Uh, so we've seen new cars equipped with this technology like Park Assist. Uh, in fact, uh, my wife's new car uh, that I bought her has has park uh, assist and to protect those expensive wheels that that she has, which is is really nice. But uh, what's next for driver assistance uh, and ADAS uh, applications out there? Yeah, well, congratulations to your wife on the new car. <laughs> um, yeah, there are a lot of features that are being added uh, to, to to the modern vehicle. Uh, we're seeing a lot. Some are leveraging uh, processing power that the cars have already uh, and leveraging the mandated requirements, whether it's for electronic braking for safety and harnessing that performance that's available in the car for other features that may be in the spectrum of convenience to safety, maybe more on the convenience like lane keep assist, uh, uh, automated uh, cruise control, adaptive cruise control. Yes. There's a lot of those features being added, uh, leveraging the hardware that's already in the vehicle. But uh, I would say, in my opinion, in the spectrum of you know safety to convenience, they're more leaning towards the convenience. What I'm more excited about and passionate about is the some of the features that are actually uh, driving more safety on the road today. Yeah. And one of them is in-cabin, uh, in-cabin monitoring. Uh, as you probably heard some figures, 94% of accidents are caused by driver error. So monitoring the guy that's doing the errors and also um, the passengers, the vulnerable passengers that may be uh, in the vehicle as well. So that's a feature that, uh, in my opinion, and what we're seeing in the market is on a, a fast growth rate in vehicles in ADAS. Yeah, that's excellent. So uh, speaking of in-cabin, which, by the way, I, I know there's been... Uh, a lot of conversation around, okay, safety versus creepy. And, and I really do hope, and you know, we, and we had these conversations before seatbelts uh, were mandated on, on what should it be. And, and it ends up that it's really not just about the safety of one person. It's about the safety of, of everybody ar around you. And uh, my favorite is gaze control uh, to, to determine, you know, are you really focused on the road or are you focused on, uh, that response that you got uh, on Twitter. But so let's talk a little bit about the future of in-cabin applications. What's what's your viewpoint? I mean, you're, you're front and center uh, working uh, with these uh, car companies or, or tier, tier ones. Uh, what are your thoughts on in-cabin? Uh, in-cabin will be further adopted. We are seeing designs, uh, you know, globally uh, incorporating, integrating in-cabin monitoring. Uh, as I mentioned, 94% is the estimate of uh, driver error, uh, accidents caused by driver error. So yeah. certainly monitoring the driver. At the expense, I know uh, many do, are concerned about privacy concerns and there's this camera looking at you. Uh, we've heard some car makers say one of their surveys with their uh, uh, um, 
users and customers are putting a sticker right on that camera because of a fear of uh, privacy. Uh, so that is, however, the safety benefit that it brings, there are too many good reasons not to do it than to, uh, to do it than not to do it, I should say. And uh, I'm glad to see Europe has been at the forefront of this Euro NCAP, NCAP standing for a new car assessment program, uh, has really recognized that in 2020 and uh, stated that it's crucial in future cars to add driver monitoring. Uh, the U.S. is slightly lagging behind. There was an, uh, a Congress Act and a Hot Cars Act in 2019. That's more catered to passengers, vulnerable passengers, children, pets being left in the vehicle, uh, and to uh, prevent from that from happening. There, you know, there's some sad uh, um, incidents that we've heard in the news every one, now and again that those would be prevented. So it certainly will bring a lot of safety, uh, and it is happening. We're seeing a lot of designs going on right now. Yeah, I, I, I love to see that. And again, you know, I'm from Texas and, and you know, gosh, up until 20 years ago, we could drink alcoholic beverages in the car. So, uh, but with that said, um, you know, the, the whole notion of pets and the whole notion of kids, I mean, who, who seriously, who, who can say no with that? Um, it, it'd be really, really hard and really sad if somebody ended up uh, turning that off. But uh, Europeans are blazing the trail and hopefully uh, uh, that'll make its way uh, to the United States uh, as well. Uh, if we can shift uh, to to LIDAR, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of folks that are like, OK, uh, you know, we don't need LIDAR because we have this special mapping program. Uh, we don't need LIDAR because uh, we have radar and cameras. Uh, what what do you think is LIDAR's uh, role in the next level of, of autonomous driving? Yeah, this topic became uh, uh, hot in the news uh, after a certain CEO mentioned that it's, uh, uh, it may not be needed, as, as you can probably, uh, as you probably know. You know, if, uh, if LIDAR was inexpensive, if it was in the cost target or the cost margin of, of imagers or radar, it would be adopted very quickly across the board. So first, it's really more of uh, the cost that's been a big hurdle of adopting LIDAR. But you know, before we talk about LIDAR, we really should take it one level higher and talk about depth and perception. So the, the vehicles, uh, they're basically trying to perceive the world around them uh, and that the world is 3D. Now, we already have depth perception in vehicles for many years. Today's ADAS actually takes a collection of a bunch of 2D images and tries to recreate the 3D world around it, or takes radar data and creates depth out of it. So we are, already have depth. We just get it indirectly through computation. Uh, and the reason we do that, because it's the right cost setup and the technology is available. So it's really more of 3D depth sensing is there, and LiDAR is yet another depth sensor. It has its uh, advantages and it has its disadvantages. Advantages being resolution relative to radar, accuracy, yeah. low light conditions, disadvantages being cost. So as the cost comes down uh, of LiDAR, uh, I think it's inevitable that you'll see LiDAR being adopted. Now, in my opinion, I see a lot of level three autonomous vehicles those that do piloted parking for uh, pilot uh, driving on highway and others will have one LIDAR looking forward. Right. And as you go to closer to full autonomy with level four and level five autonomy, you'll see four more LIDARs come in. So that's how I see LIDAR coming in. Those numbers are averages. Some, some car makers have more, some have less, but I say right. on average, you see one in level three and an additional four in level five. So it is coming. Now that's been kind of delayed with the high level autonomous vehicles being pu further pushed out in years. But uh, as, as you see it on the road, LIDAR will come with it. Yeah, I'll admit I was shocked at, uh, at your last event that was live, by the way. I think that was one of the last events that I, I did in person, how small the LIDAR sensor was. You know, I'm used to this giant you know, multiple hockey pucks uh, put on on each other like a big gulp, uh, and it was really tiny. And I know a lot of that are the mechanics that uh, of of it spinning around that that does make it larger. But I was really impressed at how small uh, it was. And 
Um, without coming across like too much of a fanboy, what I really appreciate about on semiconductor is you offer all three. You want cameras, you you want radar, you want lidar. Hey, we love them all. We sell them all. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you know you're you're the only vendor who can, who can who can say that too, which is 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 impressive. Uh, so uh, let's move to uh, full uh, full automation here. Um, you you know it is funny. It seems like it keeps getting pushed out, and I think that's good because it's we're all conservative and 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 we want things to happen. It's so funny. I remember six or seven years ago. Uh, people saying we would have full auto with uh, essentially a smartphone SOC capability. And I was just saying there was no way uh, because you had people like Google who had a supercomputer in the trunk. Uh, and, and I knew it just wouldn't be this uh, this easy. But can you talk about some of the main roadblocks and challenges to move to full autonomy? Yeah, good question. Uh, we are seeing across the board the push out of the full autonomy uh, story. You know, perception, again, the perception is the hardest uh, part of this, uh, perceiving the world around you and making those decisions based on uh, the sur your surroundings is a challenging problem. There are too many corner cases yet to be fully addressed. A lot of them have been addressed, but there are always uh, more. You know, pro processing performance, in my opinion, is there. The uh, okay. the progress in processing performance is there, and you could, uh, within the power envelope of a vehicle, you could put sufficient processing. But the pro the perception and the algorithms to, to take all that data and and come up with a, a decision, it still has some work to be done on those corner cases. Whether it's uh, snowy roads with certain yeah. markings that are occluded or, or completely not seen, whether it's fog, whether it's uh, other corner conditions of odd shaped, uh, you know, uh, roads and, and so forth. Uh, all those uh, corner cases are preventing this from uh, going wide. We are seeing some progress in some more focused, you know, whether it's uh, geofenced areas where you well define that area and then you can have, whether it's buses or, um, delivery vehicles, um, we see those progressing earlier and also trucking, uh, long haul trucking um, being the first targets. Um, so it is taking shape, but it's going to take some time just to address all conditions uh, in terms of perception. So to me, perception is a challenge. Yeah, having grown up in the Midwest, uh, I, I drove on a lot of snowy roads where there are no lane markers. In fact, uh, people had to put up stakes to let the driver know where the road uh, ended and, and where uh, you were still on the road. S super challenging uh, out there. I, I'm also glad to hear that trucks are the starting point because quite frankly, there's a lot more room that you can do. Uh, and uh, it's a commercial type of application, so the budget uh, uh, is is higher, so so it makes sense. So um, we saw a little bit of a downturn uh, in demand with COVID. I mean, there were uh, manufacturing lines that were down. Uh, incredibly enough, particularly in the United States, demand is high. I mean, it, it is hard to get uh, a new car uh, right now. And, and I'm curious, um, what's driving the automotive market specifically for sensors and EVs? Yeah, you know, uh, we did see a downturn uh, in the first half of the year, uh, but we are seeing the uh, good evidence of a rebound. Uh, cross your fingers that there's no uh, COVID 2.0. Uh, so it is good. Um, you know, what's uh, happening uh, is we're seeing uh, a lot of the inventory being depleted. Uh, yeah. Starting in 2019 with the trade war, there was there was some uh, light vehicle sales did come down. And right. because of that, everyone held up on their inventory and let it release. So there's an inventory shortage. So some of that rebound is coming from replenishing that inventory. Um, but with this rebound comes a, a new challenge now and um, across market segments, not just in automotive, that fab capacity, silicon fab capacity will be a challenge going forward. Um, you know. For us, in particular, on sensors and EV, but let's start with sensors where I live. Uh, you know, the number of cameras is increasing in quantity on your cell phones and, and other devices, in quantity, in resolution, and digital content. 
and sensors do not scale down like processors do with a smaller node. You still need those sensors to capture the light or the analog portion is still large. So there's a huge uh, increase in demand just from technology's hunger for uh, higher resolution and better perception. Uh, and now that this rebound is coming in, I anticipate there'll be some uh, um, capacity or supply challenges versus the market demand. Well, it'd be nice to have your own fab though. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> we're we're a mix. We we have a lot of external manufacturing partners, of course, uh, um, and also internal. So that gives us a good health. Elm has a good healthy mix, in my opinion. It's good. So uh, Ross, you have very high market share uh, in certain areas, but like every healthy market. Um, uh, there are competitors. And, and um, what I'd love for you to do is I'm going to give you the opportunity to uh, talk to the audience about what makes On Semiconductor unique uh, in, in, in this space. I, I think I talked about it. Uh, I think I fed you a couple of those up front, but uh, uh, what's, your, what's your point of view? Yeah, thank you. I mean, we continue to challenge ourselves uh, in terms of uh, solving the problems that our customers are seeing. Uh, in this case, with the increased autonomy in vehicles and shared vehicles and trucking, we have a big focus on uh, uh, driving quality and reliability. That's important. Why? Because traditional automotive has a certain number of hours that you drive the car, you know, a few hours a day. As you go to more shared vehicles, these vehicles are being used closer and closer to 24 seven. They're effectively data processing servers on wheels. Um, so we are designing our solutions with the quality and reliability to handle, you know, an order of magnitude higher number of operating hours. That will become important. Um, so we're always kind of outpacing also on the innovation side of what our customers need to solve their perception problems, but also on the quality and reliability. So instead of handling 8,000 hours of operating life, we handle 80,000 or over 100,000 hours. Uh, that's something that we've put a lot of investment in. The other thing, and really to address kind of the, uh, you know, some of the apprehension going on with safety and, and privacy, we're investing quite a bit in cybersecurity. So our newer line of products are adding a lot of cybersecurity measures. Um, so uh, access to the data is uh, not compromised and also it cannot be uh, um, um, accessed. So that's another thing that we're doing and we have in our uh, solutions. I, I'm hoping that the rest of the industry adopts those just like they've adopted reliability and quality, um, also uh, safety and security. Excellent. I, pre I, I appreciate that. So uh, Ross, if uh, people want to uh, know more uh, about uh, where, where can people get more information uh, about what we're talking about today? Yeah, certainly just going to our website on semi.com and just uh, searching ADAS. Uh, uh, we're on Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it, you, you'll find on semi. We're uh, one of the world leaders in semiconductors. It'll be easy to find us and uh, we'll be happy to uh, support you. This is great. So Ross, um, I, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, you're in one of the hottest spaces in one of the most successful semiconductor companies uh, out there. I really, really uh, appreciate your time. Thank you, Patrick. It was a pleasure. Appreciate yeah. it. So if you liked uh, what you heard from this episode, uh, please press that subscribe button. Uh, but until now, this is Pat Moorhead uh, concluding another episode of an insider series we'll, where we bring the most influential executives from the most influential companies in technology. Thanks and have a good day.